All right. Hey, folks. We're ready to get started. Thank you all so much for coming out this evening. And let's all first give a round of applause to our authors for being here. Uh, this is a, an area of personal significance and importance, and I'm incredibly excited to hear what uh, all three of these authors and experts have to say, and I'm really looking forward to it, and I want to thank you personally for all of the work you've done and for being here this evening. So first, uh, I would like to introduce them for any of you who may not know. Uh, first, Bella de Paolo, right here in the middle. is the leading expert on single life and has been described by The Atlantic as America's foremost thinker and writer on the single experience. Dr. DePaolo coined the term single at heart and has, written the, and has literally written the book on it and uh, had actually gave a TED talk on the subject in 2017. If you haven't watched it, you should. You should check it out. It's awesome. Uh, she is also the author of Singled Out, which we have right here, uh, The Psychology of Dexter and How We Live Now, has written the column Living Single for Psychology Today since 2008 and has been published by the New York Times, the Washington Post, Times Magazine, and other outlets. Also been interviewed on too many shows to, to name, but including the Today Show, CNN, American Morning, CBS This Morning, Good Morning America. She has a BA from Vassar College and a PhD from Harvard University. Uh, she was a professor of psychology at the University of Virginia, but moved to the West Coast, where she is currently an academic affiliate at the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences for University of California, but fortunately decided to grace up with her presence here in DC. Give another round. <laughs> Joan Del Fattore, right over here, is, uh, writes about the choice to live single and uh, particularly with respect to issues affecting healthcare. Her publications have appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine, the Washington Post, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and Psychology of Today, among others. She's appeared on NPR's All Things Considered and numerous other podcasts. And she did a TED Talk, Sick While Single, Don't Die of Discrimination. Again, I strongly recommend you check it out. And then last, but certainly not least, and last but certainly not least, right here is Dr. Chris Marsh, a sociologist at the University of Maryland, right next door. Uh, she is the author of The Love Jones Cohort, Single and Living Alone in the Black Middle Class. She has been quoted in the Washington Post, CNN, Bloomberg, and the Associated Press, among many others. She's received the Core Fulbright U.S. Scholar Award for 2017 and serves on the board of directors for Habitat for Humanity Metro Maryland and the Baltimore Regional Housing Partnership. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you again to all three of you for being here. I'm really looking forward to uh, listening to you speak. And after they're done speaking to each other, they'll give a chance for some Q&A. So everyone listen up. <laughs> First, thank you, Nathan. Thank you to Busboys and Poets. Thank you to Jill and Chris for being here and for the friends who are here watching. Oh, I'm there are, can you hear me now? Okay. There are people who shared their stories, their single at heart stories for my book, and I'm so glad to have them here. And people from the online Facebook group, the community of people welcome I haven't met most of them yet and people I don't even know so thank you everyone for <laughs> coming out in the rain I'm gonna start on page 20 if you have the book people usually don't write to advice columnists when everything in their life is exactly the way they want it to be but happy singleness did just that when she sought counsel from the Washington Post Carolyn Hacks happy singleness said I have meaningful work, a home I love, good relationships with my three grown children, and excellent friends. So the problem, quote, 
My children are suggesting I should be dating, and suddenly I'm noticing so much societal pressure to pair off. Even articles, books, blogs about happy single life and traveling and social life all seem to say, do those things and then you'll be ready when Mr. Right comes along. But I am happy now. Dates are fine, but usually I come home thinking I would have been happier reading a book. Still, I wonder, will I stay this happy? Would it be better to have a partner for my golden years? Should I put some effort into finding one? If it's not clear just how stunning that question is, do something I will advise you to do throughout this book. Flip the script and imagine a married person asking something comparable. I have been married for eight years. My life is really good. My marriage is really good. I have a home I love and good relationships with my kids. But I wonder, will I stay this happy? Would it be better to split up now so that I have enough time to invest in a life of my own? That way, I could nurture relationships with all the adults who matter to me rather than focusing primarily on just one person. I could develop the skills and strategies I will need to live my life fully and joyfully, no matter who is or is not around. Should I put more effort into living on my own? Now, that sort of inquiry seems inconceivable, but it shouldn't be. And I don't mean that I want to encourage divorce among the happily married. I don't. But I do want to revolutionize the way we think about being single. Happy Singleness was right about the books, articles, and blogs that seem to be offering an upbeat view of single life, only to end up rather grudging about the matter. We should stay single, they tell us while we ready ourselves for the time when our real lives begin, or begin again, when the right person comes along. All those writers steeped in the prevailing narratives of what it means to be single are talking past the millions of people who want something different, something that describes and validates their experiences and makes them feel seen. This book is dedicated to all the people craving a more enlightened understanding of single life. So now I'm going to read some from the introduction. <clears throat> Lovers of single life, set yourselves free. Unshackle yourselves from those old regressive stories that claim that single life is sad and lonely. Rise above those repressive notions that everyone wants a romantic partner. And if you think you don't, you'll get over it. And if you don't get over it, you need help. <laughs> Gleefully reject the idea that putting a romantic partner at the center of your life is something you have to do, something everyone wants, or that it is the normal, natural, and superior way to live. I have a new story to tell you. My story is about people who are powerfully drawn to single life. I call them single at heart, and I'm one of them. For us, single life is our best life. It is our most authentic, meaningful, and fulfilling life. It is a psychologically rich life. No other way of living will ever feel as profoundly satisfying. To us, living single is every bit as normal, natural, comfortable, and desirable. To people who are drawn to coupled life, we are the curators of our lives. <laughs> okay. Being single doesn't limit our lives. It throws them wide open. We have our freedom, and we use it to make the most of our resources and opportunities, however vast or meager they may be. We get to decide the shape and contours of our lives, from our daily routines to life-altering transformations. We get to pursue our interests and passions. 
without trying to refashion or resize them in ways that suit a romantic partner. We get to welcome into our lives anyone we want, friends, relatives, mentors, colleagues, lovers, neighbors, spiritual figures, pets, or anyone else, as many or as few as we like, with no pressure to elevate a romantic partner above all others. We can devote ourselves to our inner circle, our larger communities, our countries, and our causes, if that's what we want to do. We create homes that are our sanctuaries. We have our sweet, sweet solitude. If we don't want kids, no partner is going to pout. If we do want kids, we get to raise them as we see fit. We enjoy intimacy on our own terms. The risk to people who are single at heart is not what we will miss if we do not put a romantic partner at the center of our lives, but what we will miss if we do. I will never say that it's okay to be single. I will never say that it's better to be single than to be in a bad romantic relationship or that it's better to be single than to wish you were. All those sentiments are far too grudging. For people who are single at heart, it is better to be single, period. People who are single at heart share the joy we experience by living single. Being single is something we savor. It doesn't matter if we have had no past romantic experiences or plenty of them. It doesn't matter if our romantic experiences were glorious, horrifying, boring, or a mixed bag. It doesn't matter if we had a miserable childhood or an exemplary one. We are not defined by any of those things. We are not single just because we're running away from something or because we have issues. Everyone has issues. <laughs> we are single because we love what single life offers and will continue to offer for as long as we commit to it and invest in it. For us, that's forever. We don't ever want to unsingle ourselves. We realize we are bucking the relentlessly touted and celebrated cultural script that insists that what adults want more than anything else is a committed romantic partnership. We know what people think, that it's fine to be single for a while, but to stay single is just sad. And to want to stay single isn't natural or normal. Over the course of my lifetime, I've seen other bedrock beliefs pulverized. Is it abnormal to be attracted to people of your own gender? We know better now. Is a woman's place in the home? Oh, please. <laughs> Is it only natural for women to want kids? That doesn't seem obvious anymore. Each time our understanding of human nature becomes more expansive, we all become freer to live our best and most authentic lives. In the enlightened world that I envision, every child will understand as a matter of course that living single is a life path that can be just as joyful and fulfilling as any other and for some people, the best path of all. Uh, every adult will forsake forever the temptation to pity or patronize people who are single and will instead appreciate the profound rewards of single life. Adults who are naturally drawn to single life will not be asked to defend that choice ever again. Millions of happy single people will realize that they are th happy and thriving, not in spite of being single, but because of it. Because we who are single at heart are embracing our single lives rather than trying to escape them, we develop strengths, skills, resources, and attitudes that are less often honed by those who lead a conventionally coupled life. The time, money, and emotional resources that some other people devote to their pursuit of a romantic partner and then bestow upon that partner if they find such a person 
we invest in experiences that make our lives meaningful and that can never be taken away from us by divorce or any other cash any other casualty of coupling. We value our friends rather than looking past them for the romantic partner who may be on the horizon or waiting for us at home. Because we don't split the tasks of everyday life with a romantic partner, we learn how to cover everything ourselves, either by mastering the tasks, finding ways around them, or figuring out how to find people who will help or who we can hire. Because we plan to stay single, we create homes that will continue to accommodate, comfort, and inspire us as we age. Our years of investing in our single lives and embracing all that single life has to offer pay off all along the way, but the investment comes to its ultimate stereotype shattering pinnacle later in life. We've been warned that we are going to end up decrepit, despondent, despairing, and oh so alone when we are old. But that's not what happens. Studies show that it is the people who have stayed single who are most likely to be flourishing in later life. Unlike the newly single, such as the divorced and widow people who organize their lives around a spouse, the lifelong single people aren't trying to figure out for the first time how to do the things their spouse used to do for them. Lifelong single people never demote the people who matter to them once a spouse waltzes into their lives. They aren't trying to create a social circle or an or an emotional support system anew. They've been doing that all along. I'm going to end with a story I tell um, at the end of the introduction. As I write this, I am 69 years old, I'm 70 now, <laughs> all decrepit. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> okay. Living in Summerlin, California, and I've been single my whole life. I live alone and don't have kids or pets. I had a few romantic relationships when I was very young, but I would have been truer to myself if I had none at all. I wake up every morning feeling immensely grateful that I get to live this single life that I cherish. For the first 45 years of my life, my mother never said a word about my single status. In the seven years she lived after my father died, we occasionally traveled together, just the two of us, and we spent some holidays together. We talked about a lot of things, but she never pressured me to marry, not even subtly. I was proud of that. I thought it meant that she could see that staying single wasn't an issue for me. I never complained about it. I never collected bridal magazines or mused dreamily about some future prince. I had an engaging career in Charlottesville where I taught at the University of Virginia for several decades. I owned a home that I loved. No such owning a home in California. <laughs> it's way too expensive. <clears throat> um, I've always had close friends, and she met many of them. In the last conversation I had alone with her, as she lay dying, she brought up my single life for the first time. I worry about you, she said. I don't remember what I said in response, but I do remember that I was stunned and saddened. I wish she had understood that for me and the millions like me, staying single was how I stayed happy and fulfilled. I wish I knew then what I know now and could have helped her to understand. I wish I had already written this book.
Bella, thank you very much. And I'd like to start actually by thanking Bella, not only for the things that she's written, but for her support of the rest of us who wanted to start writing about single studies long after she did. My own, I had written books about something else as a professor, but my own first piece about single life was published by Bella on her Psychology Today blog. And I know there are other people in this room who have also published on that blog. Bella, at one point, was pretty much the only person doing this. She used her prominence and her standing, her understanding, to mentor the rest of us, to bring us along, to grow the field, which is now blossoming. So, Bella, thank you, not only for your writing, but for what you've done for the field. Thank um, you for saying that. <laughs> let me ask you a question relative to um, the time you've been doing this. You've been publishing for about 20 years yeah. in this field. What do you see happening that's the same as when you started? What's different from when you started in terms of how single people live and how single people are seen in oh, society? That's a great question. One of the really good things is that the number of single people in the United States and all around the world just keeps growing. And one of the good things about that is it seems to come with a bit of consciousness raising, to use an old fashioned term. So to go back to when there were uh, more sections of newspapers and magazines and other online publications that invited people to write comments, when I saw a comment that was filled with singleism, my word for the stereotyping, stigmatizing, and discrimination against singleism, I would jump in this to the comment section and I'd object to it and I'd be the only one. Well, within a few years when that happened, I would go to the comment section and there would already be 12 more people who had, um, who had commented. So you know, just little things like that were really exciting. And then in 2015, I started this online Facebook group called the Community of Single People. And it's for single people who like being single. We talk about everything about our single lives except dating and trying to escape being single. You can't do that there. It's not allowed. <laughs> and it not, well, at the beginning of this week, it had about 7,600 members from 100 different countries. Then, um, a few days ago, the Huffington Post published an essay I wrote, and it was called something like, I'm 70 and I've lived alone my entire life. This is what people get wrong about people who are single? Well, the first day after that came out, 300 people joined the community of single people, and the next day, 300 more joined. So it was amazing. And I got over 100 emails from people who read that poem, which I haven't answered yet. So if you sent me one, I'm sorry, but I am going to get to it. I was just overwhelmed and so, so happy. But along with all the good stuff, something else happens. There's now all this rah-rah marriage stuff going on. <clears throat> so David Brooks, a couple months ago, wrote some column about, like, marriage is everything. You know, it's not career. It's not anything else. It's got to be marriage. Then this book was written. It came out maybe, I don't know, a month or so ago about saying, you know, you just have to accept that two parent families are the best. So, you know, live with it. And that got tons of attention. And I have a, a chapter on single parent families, which uh, questions that quite a bit. Um, and then there's this book coming out. There's a whole um, heavily funded uh, pro-marriage, I like to call it the pro-marriage mafia. They have, tons, they have tons of support. And one of their main leaders is writing a book that says something like, or he has written, it'll be out on or the day before Valentine's Day, which is something like, get married, you know, make the liberals mad and save civilization. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> and what I think all this means, all this, um, oh, you know, where it really is good, it's going to save you, it's going to save civilization, and you need two parents, and all that stuff. It's not because we're all so secure about the place of marriage in our lives and in society, it's because we're so insecure. 
It's what Susan Faludi many years ago called backlash as in, to describe what was happening to, when women started making progress and people just freaked out. And I think that's what happened, what's happening. People are kind, are kind of freaking out a little bit about single people not being apologetic about being single, not staying in their place. And so, that, so that's, uh, that's the answer to that, I think. A short answer, anyway. I, too, want to echo what was already said, that if it were not for you, Bella, there would, no, there would be no Love Jones cohort book. I appreciate you. I thank you. And I'm so happy to be able to celebrate Single at Heart here with you. Oh, thank you. I'm so happy you're here. It's so touching because in the back of the book, you acknowledge that, you know, it's, it means a lot to you when I come to California and we're able to break bread together. Yeah. Now you're on my side of town. Yeah. I get to break bread with you. Yeah. So I'm just so happy yeah. to have you here. Now, one of the things I don't want to do is I don't want to say all the golden nuggets that are in the book. So I want everybody to buy the book. And I want it to be a bestseller. So I feel like <laughs> so I'm not going to talk specifically about things that are in the okay. book. But I wanted to just ask some questions about like the structure oh, of the book. Okay. There's two things that like resonated with okay. me. I was like, oh, gosh, I want to know why Bella did this. Yeah. One of them I think is so important when you talk about flip the script. Yeah, and let me tell you what that, that resonated with me because when I was when I had the earlier draft of the book, I guess I should be talking to you all. Well, no, I'm talking to Bella. Yeah, when I had earlier drafts of the book, you emailed me like, Chris, can you please think about flipping the script on this? And you said it in an email, and then you did it in the book. And I think you actually did it um, eight times. I think you flipped the script, and you also talked about advice at least 24 times. You talked about advice to those that are single at heart, yeah. to our allies, and to those that are interested. Can you talk a little bit more about why you did flip the script, why the advice, and the eight times I was talking about was actually fix it. Right. You talk about fix it. So please okay. tell us, I don't, if you don't know what fix okay. it means, you have to read right. the book. But tell us why you did fix it. Okay. I'm going to give an example of each of those things. Okay. That's okay. okay. All right. So fixed it. I take something that was published out there. Um, usually by someone prominent or by some prestigious source, and I decided it's wrong, and so I fix it. So here's an example. <clears throat> this is from Vivek Murthy, who is the Surgeon General of the United States in a book he calls Together. He's been talking a lot about, um, about loneliness. And this quote from the book is, although he was single, he had a community of people he liked. Seriously? So I fixed it to, like so many other single people, he had a community of people he liked. And actually there's research, lots of research showing that single people are actually more connected to other people than people who aren't single. Now let me give you an example of something else I call flipping the skip. This is a little longer, but bear with me. I think it's good. It's from Simon. He emailed me and he said, I've been completely single for over 11 years with only one relationship before then. About three years ago, I started solo traveling for the first time and there I discovered an intense joy I felt while being completely alone. I believe it was actually life changing. However, Sometimes the longing for love, for romantic connection, still comes up. And occasionally it gets so strong that sometimes I wonder if all the traveling, all the fun things I do by myself, are really just a way to fill the hole in my life when what I actually want is a relationship. How do we know if we really like being single or if we are just covering up a void of not having a relationship? So I told Simon, I don't think there's an obvious answer to your question, but I do think that cultural conditioning makes it way more likely that we'll think we crave romantic relationships than to think we crave solitude. Now here's the flipping the script part. <clears throat> Imagine if we flipped the script and Simon instead asked this. About three years ago, I got married for the first time and discovered an intense joy I felt from my connection to my spouse. I believe it was actually life-changing. However, sometimes my longing for what I had when I was single <clears throat> still comes up, and occasionally it gets so strong 
that sometimes I wonder if all the attention I am lavishing on my spouse and all that I invest in my marriage are just a way to fill the hole in my life when what I actually want is to be single. <laughs> okay, so I, I do that again and again throughout the book. There, there are boxes that are throughout. And one reason I did it is um, because I was trying to think of a way to make it persuasive. You know, if I just read you what Simon said originally, I think a lot of people would say, well, what's wrong with that? <laughs> and same thing for the fixed it things. They think, well, there's something wrong with saying, you know, you can't spread. Um, and so I think flipping the script makes it more evident than it would if I just tried to argue it with you by saying, you know, there's research supporting this, even though there is research supporting this. So that's what I did. <clears throat> About the advice, um, I put that in there, kicking and screaming. My agent, Bridget Matsey, said I should. <laughs> and I really didn't want to, but she was right. <laughs> And I get asked about it all the time. People really appreciate that I put it in there. And when I was crafting each advice, which comes at the end of each of the middle sections, I went to the online community of Facebook, uh, community of single people on Facebook, and I posted the, my draft there and said, tell me what to do differently. <laughs> and so it's all been vetted. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, community of single people. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, it, you know, people do wonder what they should do. And some of the things are not that obvious. And some of the things that our allies asked about are not that obvious. So now I'm reconciled. <laughs> okay, another question. Okay. Uh, as an academic, mm -hmm. you had written for many years about lying. Yes. Uh, I believe you are not in favor of it. <laughs> About the psychology of lying. What happened that inspired you? I mean, did a stroke come out of heaven? What happened that inspired you to start writing about single life? I was noticing. Well, you know, like I said, I've been single my whole life. I was noticing things that sort of bugged me. So, for example, um, the person who organized the class schedule at UVA asked me to come in at night, and she said it would be too hard for the married faculty. And that was before they even had kids. <laughs> or another thing that happened, I had these great colleagues at UVA in my social area, and we used to go to lunch during the day. But then on the weekends, so the couples would socialize with each other, and I'd be left out. <laughs> and you know, I kind of wondered, is that just me, or is it because I'm single? And it's hard to know when it, it, when it just applies to you. But anyway, then there, there was another thing. I started noticing the way people talk about single people. So the first time I collected what you might call um, roughly a piece of research, really just anecdotal, was on December 17th, 1992, I was living in Charlottesville, and um, a widowed person wrote into an advice columnist saying that she was really sad around the holidays. And the advice columnist wrote back to her and said, one is a whole number. And it went on from there. And I underlined that, and I put it in this new secret folder I started, which just had one on the tab. This is before everything was on physical folder I could have pulled in my hands. And I didn't think, I was 39 at the time, I didn't think I wasn't a whole person just because I was single. But I thought it was curious that people thought about single life that way, that they thought they'd have to reassure someone who was single that one is a whole number. <laughs> and then, even worse, I discovered that prestigious publications who think of themselves as cutting edge and the intellectual vanguard, like the New Yorker, the New York Times, they were publishing things with that exact same presumption of 
you know, there's something inferior. There's a, it's a lesser life to be single. You can still find it now. <laughs> and, um, and so I, I had this folder full of things. If you're old enough, you might remember Kathy cartoons. That was the single person. What was her main thing that she said? <laughs> really? That's my single life? <laughs> I don't think so. So, um, that, so I started collecting these things. Then a few years later, I was at a social event where, and I went up to a woman. I knew she was single, but I didn't know her very well. And I said, have you ever had the experience? And I told her a few of my exa examples. I told you about getting asked to come in late to, to teach or, or getting, you know, demoted on the weekends. <laughs> and, and I said, have you ever had these experiences? And she said, oh, yes. And she started telling me. Then somebody else heard us talking, and they joined. And then somebody else heard. And we had this big circle of people, and we talked the rest of the night. Then I came home, and I opened a physical notebook with a pen, and I wrote for two hours trying to remember all the examples they sent me. Then the next morning, I opened my email, and I had emails from several of them saying, and another thing I forgot to tell you. So then, a month later, about a month later, I was invited to give a talk at Yale about my reception research. But afterwards, they had a reception for me, and I did the same thing. And the same thing happened. So that's when I realized, this is resonating. This is something people want to talk about, they're thinking about. And so I wanted to write something that wasn't just for fellow academics. So that's when I wrote singled out how singles are stereotyped, stigmatized, and ignored, and still live happily ever after. Fantastic. Um, that is so fantastic. I appreciate the story. Uh, Kathy, that's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I have kind of a, uh, a two-part question. Um, it's to your point, you were saying that you went to the party and the next morning, yeah. like, and this, and this, yeah, and this, yeah. and there's more stuff they want to add to the conversation. Right. So I guess the question is, the book could only be 300 pages or 277, <laughs> right, I think right. it is. What else would you have want to put in the book that didn't make it into the book is my first question. And then my second kind of question, I noticed a couple of times at least twice, you said single at heart has superpowers. Yes. And I want you to please talk about the superpowers oh, right. that single at heart have, okay. please. Hey, yes. Um, what did I not put in? Um, I don't wish that I put it in, but, but I took some things out because they were too snarky. <laughs> <laughs> so I, w I will confess one of them here. One of them was about what you see people doing on national where they'll say, oh, my colleague, uh, so-and-so just had a baby, or she just got married, and they'll all make a big fuss, and they'll show a picture of the baby, maybe they'll show pictures of the wedding. Well, why aren't they doing that when their colleague wins a Pulitzer Prize? Or, you know, wait a minute. And, you know, they don't seem to notice that. Or, or feel self-conscious that their uh, supposed achievements are getting recognized and the more relevant achievements of their colleagues, many of whom are single, are just getting, you know, we're not going to talk about that. Who cares about a prize? You know, so, so I took out stuff like that. <laughs> um, and, oh, superpowers, right. I am so sick of all this um, stuff about, oh, you poor, lonely, single people, and loneliness is, is going to, oh, this is thing that, that even, that was in um, a stodgy academic journal and is now all over the place, including in the New Yorker. It's that um, living alone is, or living in isolation is the equivalent to smoking six uh, 15 cigarettes a day in terms of what it does to your health. Well, you know, what that misses is that some people love being alone. I mean, what would be 15 cigarettes to me is if I had to live with someone. <laughs> that would send me under. <laughs> no. 
So I think that the single heart, I didn't anticipate this. I thought, since I love my solitude, and I like socializing too, but I thought, well, the single heart, on average, they're going to appreciate their solitude more than people who are single at heart. But it was way more than that. Every single person who shared their stories with me when I asked, how important, if at all, is it to you to have time to yourself? Everyone said, really important. Um, some of them said it in emphasis. Three people said it was like breathing. And I think that 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 is a superpower because one, if you savor your time alone, you are less likely to feel lonely. Two, it's, it protected us from the worst of the pandemic when other people were going, you know, just having the hardest time spending time by themselves. We were like, yeah, we know how to do this. We've got this. <laughs> and, and when we head into later life, we're never going to be that stereotypical, isolated um, old person who feels isolated and feels lonely. So in that sense, it's a slow power. Uh, this actually refers to your uh, research over the years, not only what's in this particular book. You referred to what you call the marriage mafia <laughs> or the matrimaniacs. And uh, the studies that we see, get married and you'll be happy, get married and you'll be healthy. Yeah. And you often use the word cheating, Yes, that the research cheats. Right. Can yes. you tell us how it cheats? Yes. Okay. So you will see the same. You still see this claim over and over again. Married people are happier, they're healthier. You know, get married and you will be happier and healthier too. But what they're showing you when they do this is comparing people who are currently married to people who are single. They're saying, see, they're doing better, which they don't always, even in that comparison. But look at the cheating involved in that. They're taking all the people who got married, hated it, and got divorced, close to 50% in the United States, and putting them aside. Don't look over there. We're not counting them. So the better kind of study is to follow the same people over the course of their lives and ask them every year, how happy are you? How healthy are you? Are you married? Are you single? What, what's going on? And so now there were, um, as of 2012, there were already 18 studies like that. Now there's many more. And what they find is that when people go from being single to getting married, some of them experience a free um, experience of just a little, you know, the sound of joy around the time of the wedding. You know, they're getting presents. They're having this big party. It's really exciting. <laughs> but then they go back to being, over time, they go back to being as happy or as unhappy as they were when they were single. And the only people who get what, what, come, what gets to be called the honeymoon effect, where you get a little bit happier right at the very beginning of your marriage, um, the only people who, are, who experience it are those who get married and stay married. The people, and they know from these studies, because they go on for years and years and years, so they know who got married and who stayed and who got divorced. And the people who would, were headed toward divorce, on average, were already becoming less happy as the day of their wedding approached rather than Even uh, more recently, there were several really good studies, very good methodologically, that again followed people uh, for years and years and years, and found that um, one of them found that people who got married actually felt less healthy than they were when they were single. And you know, these studies are still biased in favor of giving giving good results for married people because they only include people who wanted to get married, right? So if studies included people like me and forced us for some reason to get married, you know, it would be even worse. Okay, so I have a question and it's kind of an unfair question. Um, <laughs> I say it's fine now until I hear it. I'm like, great. Right. Yeah. Um, so I really appreciate, appreciate the chapter when you talked about having a medical procedure 
and a ride. I also appreciate all of the ninth chapter, I think it is, because it really talks about some of the policy implications yeah. and how some of these institutions are discriminating in plain sight. If you could pick one and you had to pick one, is there one policy that really resonates with you that you would like to see happen for single folks, especially single at heart? Okay, I'm going to punt that to Joan because she is the absolute expert on medical care for single people. Thank you. Um, actually, the problem, as I see it, is not so much that the policies don't exist, but the actual staff people don't follow those policies. Nathan and I were talking about this before this started. So, for example, there is a federal law that says that you're allowed to choose your caregivers, you're allowed to choose who gets your medical information, you're allowed to choose who's allowed into the hospital to see you. That is in federal law. But try getting that activated in an actual hospital because this staff is so family oriented that they don't even stop to think that your best support might be elsewhere. Uh, I had actually been telling Nathan before, I was in an emergency room one time. I, by the way, I'm 77 years old. I have never been married. I have never had a marriage-like relationship nor ever wanted one. I was in an emergency room and I said I was going to call a friend to pick me up and take me home. Oh no, the nurse said, it has to be immediate family. I don't have any immediate family. So I told her, well, all of my immediate family are dead. So unless you That's intend to keep sorry. me as a pet, I am going to have to call a friend. What she did was illegal. The problem is training, it, answering Chris's question, the policy change I would like to see is better training for the staff to carry out the policies that already exist. The other policy change I would like to see is in family leave laws, where you can take paid time off your job only for people with blood or legal relationships, which means that somebody like me cannot take paid time off either to, to to take care of anyone, no matter how close they are to me, and nobody can take time off to care for me. That can't continue, given Bella's book on how we live now, because too many of us don't live that way anymore. Why are you talking about yeah, Chris, I wanted to ask you, uh, yeah. <laughs> First of all, I loved your book. I absolutely love the Love Jones cohort. If you have not read it, you need to read this book. It's right um, there. It's right there. <laughs> can, can you tell, same question I had asked Bella. I, I think it's always interesting how people come to do that kind of a project. What inspired you to write that particular book, the Love Jones cohort? Thank you. So I really wanted to make this all about Bella today. But I'll tell you briefly about the book and where the title came from. So uh, one of the things I got tired of having this conversation around is why aren't single black women getting married? I wanted to destigmatize singlehood and I want us to think about singlehood in more nuanced kind of ways. And so I wanted to talk about what singles were doing. We always have a conversa conversation around what they're not and what they don't have, but we don't flip the script and have a conversation about what they are doing. And so Bella kind of alluded to it in the book and I, t I explicitly say it in my book, after reading this book, I hope you're just as likely to ask somebody, why are you married, as you are to ask somebody, why are you single? We always ask single folks why you're single, but we don't ask the same question of married folks. So I'm, all I'm asking us to do is be consistent. Either ask nobody or ask everybody, but don't just always ask the, ask the single people because we normalize marriage. And especially as we go into the holiday season, be very careful in the way in which you talk to singles that are in your family. So I really just wanted to destigmatize singlehood and I want to push the conversation forward and not look at singlehood as a deficit model, but celebrate singleness and celebrate what people who were single and in the, living alone in the black middle class, how were, they were navigating their singleness. And people often ask like where the title of the book came from and I actually appreciate as we're getting started, if you happen to listen overhead, they were playing the soundtrack from the movie Love Jones. So there is a movie called Love Jones, and it talks about people that were young, black professionals who weren't married, didn't have any children. In fact, the movie came out 26 years ago. 
I was trying really hard to have the book come out the same year as the movie, but it came out 26, year late, 26 years later, but I'm okay with it being 26 as opposed to being 25. But what I noticed is that when we thought about the quintessential black middle class family on television, we often hearken to the Huxtables on The Cosby Show, this heteronormative mother, father, five beautiful children, and a black picket fence. But we started to see this demographic shift show up in the movie Love Jones. So for me as a scholar, I wanted to draw from popular culture, but then I'm also a sociologist and a demographer, so I wanted to use a traditional demographic term. So a cohort means nothing more than a band of people. So I put it all together and I came up with the title. It's really cool when you write a title that's kind of like interesting because people will buy the book just alone on the title. Unfortunately, sometimes they won't read the book and I get <laughs> nasty grams about how I'm bad for black America, how I'm supporting, um, I'm, not, I'm supporting the rise of single parenthood, how I'm just talking about these absent fathers. I don't talk about single parents in my book. I appreciate that you do in your book and how um, they often talk about how I'm just bad for black love and black marriages and black relationships. And I would argue that I'm actually trying to be more inclusive of the way in which we think about love. One of the arguments that I make in the book is that can you be a single uh, family of one? If we use the definition that the Census Bureau talks about for the family of one, it's someone that you're related to by blood, marriage, or adoption. But if you are not in a household like that and you are by yourself and you're alone with yourself, can you be a family of one? Is one of the questions that I would ask Bella in my book. I'm like, you talk about families and you talk about chosen families and I can't remember the other word that you use. Oh gosh, chosen family. I can't remember the other word. Yeah. Um, chosen families and found family. Right. Okay, so the question in the book, I in my book I argue that we need to redefine the way in which we think about family. If it's, uh, Census Bureau, again, says it's somebody that you're married to, you're, you're related to by blood, marriage, or mm -hmm. adoption. Mm -hmm. So do you think that we should have a family of one based on the conversation that you're having in the book and or augmented families where it's someone that you're not in a romantic relationship, but they are a friend because a friend plays, friends play a central role throughout the thread of the book. Yeah. So I'm gonna pose that question to you. You know, for sure we need to to take found families or chosen families more seriously. And they're the ones that have us at the uh, pinnacle. You can think family of one or family of one include the people that we want included in our lives. And that's just so important now with the demographics shifting the way they are, um, with fewer people getting married, fewer people having kids, people who have kids having fewer kids than they used to. So it's not unusual for uh, people to grow up without siblings or cousins or, and so if you, d and to not have a spouse or kids of your own. So if you don't have um, these traditional family members, the ones that are considered traditional, then the whole set of policies and perspectives need to change. And Joan told us about one obvious, important way, not obvious to other people, but once you say it, it's obvious, um, important ways to, to deal with that. Can you say something about your work? Uh, actually, I had been saying this to Bella earlier. I am delighted by the success of Bella's book <laughs> and by the success of Chris's book. They have both done beautifully. I am delighted for them. But I have to admit, I'm also delighted for those of us who are about to send out book proposals. <laughs> because the dreaded comparable section has now become a whole lot easier to write. Because you can say, look what is happening with Bella's book. Look what is happening with Chris's book. I think it is important for not only for single people, but for those around us to recognize what Bella was saying before, the way we live is valid in and of itself. Uh, Bella has talked elsewhere about deficit narratives, about treating singlehood as a deficit, as the absence of something. If you think about it, I just used the word singlehood, we don't really even have a word for it, do we? An accepted word, we say not married. Mm -hmm. We don't have an affirmative statement for those of us who choose to live in a different way. I am so delighted that it is becoming more common and more accepted. 
In fact, part of what I, I want to say in the book that I'm working on is ways in which the American medical system needs to get its collective head out of the 1950s. And I was there in the 1950s. Even in the 50s, people didn't live the way they assumed we did. Not everybody had a dedicated caregiver. Not everybody had a driver who could take them to unlimited medical appointments at any time of the day or night. How many married people today can't meet that expectation? So I think it's important in various ways. I've chosen the medical field because of stuff that happened to me. And I think, and I know other people are, are writing about other aspects of this. I think it's very important to keep saying from a number of different directions. These are the different ways in which not just we have to change policy, but we have to change the insides of our heads. We need to think about this differently. I just want to echo something that uh, Bella said in the book, and especially because it is around the holiday season. And we're going to go see family and close friends. And oftentimes when we're single, our single dating life becomes open consumption. Everybody wants to know about our, our dating lives and what's going on in our lives. And Bella says so eloquently in the book that you could be snarky with your response back when someone says like, are you dating anybody? What's going on? Um, and one of the things that, uh, one piece of advice that Bella gives in the book is she draws from like one of the comments that I made is that when someone says like, well, are you dating or you're not, why aren't you married? One of the easiest, most benign things you can say back to a person, but gets them to think about what they just said is to say, well, what do you mean by that? I mean, you could read them from Amazing Grace to how sweet it is and cuss them out and tell them you need to read this book and blah, blah, blah. And you can, and I'm not saying you shouldn't. And Bella might, might want them to do that sometimes. But one way for them to think about it, because one of the things that's probably gonna happen, so when some, so, someone says like, why aren't you married? And you say, what do you mean by that? One of the three things is probably gonna happen. They're probably gonna stutter, they're gonna stammer. Or two, they're gonna be like, oh, you know what I mean, or you know. Or they're gonna be like, oh, never mind, forget it. But what happens is that you've now made them go home and think about what they've said. You, in my book, a lot of the people that were single talked about how they had to get their narratives ready for the holidays. And so I'm thinking everybody should get their narratives ready and explain why they're married. Everybody should get their <laughs> right? Single folks have to get their narratives together. Married folks have to get theirs. But then also, don't go home leaving only you thinking about that. It's like, it doesn't matter how many degrees I have. It doesn't matter about my academic pedigree. As long as I don't have an MRS degree, that's all that matters to you. So ask them what they, what do you mean by that? And it'll make them go home and really resonate with the question that they're asking and some of these hidden assumptions behind the question that they're asking. And Bella talks about that in the book. She talks into more detail. So please do pick up the, pick up the book and read it. Yeah. <laughs> it's such a great piece of advice. I think we can. Okay. Yes, for sure. Hello. Uh, I got a, I got a couple questions. Uh, first question is, it seems like you have done a lot of surveys for single people. In your surveys, have you found? Uh, I know it's not all rainbow in candy to the single. Um, and it seems like it's very idealized uh, what you have to said. Uh, in your surveys, have you found uh, what those hassles are of being single for those of us who may be thinking about going into the lifestyle? Oh, so, well, you mean for people who are interested but not quite sure they're going to like it? I think the most important thing is to just try it. So, for example, if you're not quite sure you're going to love spending time by yourself, um, give yourself the gift of some time to yourself. And make sure you use it to do things you enjoy, not, you know, don't use it to do the and chores that you hate. Um, and, you know, see what you think. And um, adopt a single heart mindset. So think of your friends as valuable people, not, oh, they're just friends. But, you know, attend to them and don't, don't promote them. <laughs> um, and use your freedom to pursue what you really enjoy the most. So even if you're single and you want to be coupled. You can, you can live your single life temporarily 
the way people who are single at heart live it all the time, which is to pursue your values, your interests. Um, I call it living authentically. When you're single, you're following your values, what you care about, what your interests are, and not try to trying to shape them around the interests of a spouse. All right, second question. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Second question is, I noticed that uh, the speakers here tonight are all females, and then 70% of the audience is females. Is it easier for females to make that jump into a single life than for males? Oh. And second third question is, is are, are men single because women make that decision for them? Oh, my gosh. Thank you for that question. This was something that genuinely surprised me. First, let me talk about single people in general, not just the single at heart. If you look at research on single people in general, women do better at it than men do. And I think it's because they're much better at making friends and pretending to friends. They're used to doing all the domestic stuff. So, you know, it's not like, how do I wash dishes? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and um, it's surprised, maybe surprisingly, women like solitude more than men do, which I think is really interesting. So I thought that more women than men would be single at heart. It's not true. More men than women are single at heart. And, but when you think of what single at heart means, it means you like your freedom. You like being able to craft a life that's consistent with your goals and your values. It means that you like to pay attention to a number of people, I call it single people have the ones and married people have the ones. Um, and, and, and you just go down the list of all the kinds of things that are about being single at heart. And I said to myself, self, what's wrong with you? Why wouldn't men be great at this? And I love it because, you know, we usually think single women get, get bashed more than single men. They're the spinsters and men are the bastards. And all that stuff is true. But single men are really getting trashed these days. You know, they're seen as incels. And, you know, some of them are. But, um, but that kind of thing gets applied broadly to all single men. Single men and really sing men who are single at heart are living an especially mature and sophisticated and fulfilling version of single life. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you. And I'd like to thank my friend for inviting me. I wish my mom could be here to yeah. hear this. <laughs> um, Perfect. Um, Great. But I, first of all, I want to thank all of you for like the amazing work. I never had the language to talk about kind of the life that I have always hoped to lead. So this is just really inspiring. And I would love to hear all of your just thoughts and wisdoms on how to keep having the conversation to change people's minds, whether it's flipping the script, asking what do you mean by that, forging forward on policy changes or like yeah. education on policy that's already in act. Right. Like, what, how do you guys recommend that we as just the average single at heart person yeah. change this narrative that we've grown up with for so long? Why don't we go around? You can start in about a second. Uh, thank you. That's a great question, and um, I'm glad that we have the YouTube up so you can watch that. Um, to have the conversation. The reason why I asked, again, the book is fantastic, and the reason why I asked Bella the question about fixed it and flipped the script is because I'm sure you could have written a whole chapter on that. But even in our singleness, sometimes we make some hit. there's some hidden assumptions that we even make about single folks, about people in the same category. So we have to constantly have the conversation and we constantly have to challenge ourselves to think about some of the implicit biases that we hold about single people, even if we are single ourselves. And the conversation is really helping us to kind of tease some of that out. And again, I would love to see a whole chapter on fixed it because some of the things I didn't even realize it until you said it. So really, those really are golden nuggets and they're teaching moments. And I would admonish you to sit there with the minute 
but to flip the script. And before you read it, think about what needs to be changed before Bella has to explain to you what needs to be changed, because sometimes you won't always see it. And I appreciate Bella because she gives us a chance to kind of think through that. Thank you. <laughs> and yeah, and those are, are set off in boxes, so you can flip pages and find them very easily. Um, one thing I would say is that people are, who are single at heart need to own their lives and not be um, reticent about saying how they really feel. Um, years ago, a, a, um, a reporter from the Washington Post came and interviewed me and, and a number of other single people, and she wrote a cover story for the magazine. And in the cover story, she said, you know, I, I talked to Belle, and she talked about this single heart thing, and she said, and then as I was driving home, or flying home, whatever, she said, um, I started thinking about my, fr my single friends, and I realized none of them are single at heart. This, this isn't a thing. I mean, she didn't really put it that way, but <laughs> that was the implication. Well, what I have found from the people who share their stories with me is that sometimes they are reluctant to own up to it. So one person told me about, um, she was having lunch with a colleague, and the colleague said, oh, you know, do you want to be married someday? And she said, no, I don't believe in the institution of marriage. And then the colleague said, well, you do want a committed romantic relationship, right? And she said she just couldn't get herself to say no. She thought it would just be too weird. So she said, oh, yeah, of course. And I just wonder how many people out there who are single and love being single don't want to say so because they think they'll be seen as weird. And it is true that they will be, they will be judged and they will be questioned. I mean, people say to us, oh, you just think you're happily single. You know, you'll get over it. When do you meet the right person? It's just a phase. I mean, imagine flipping the script. Imagine saying that to a married person. Oh, you just think you're happily married. <laughs> You'll get over it. <laughs> uh, along the same lines with regard to stereotypes, a uh, former mayor of New York, Ed Koch, has a wonderful quote to the effect that stereotypes only last until you actually look at them and you realize they don't hold. Uh, to give one example, Craig Wynn over there, um, Craig has written a good deal about being a happy bachelor, including a book, A Happy Bachelor, uh, and uh, a blog. So he and I co-authored a piece for Bella's Psychology Today blog on uh, gender differences. And we were particularly getting into the stereotypes. So the part that I wrote talked about how singlism is, for women is very much tied in with women's rights historically. So for example, historically, a single man could get an apartment in his own name, a single woman could not. I had been out of college for seven years, working full time for seven years, before American law changed to say I had a right to a credit card in my own name as a single woman. And that same law said that they couldn't continue to ask, to tell women, married women, that they needed their husband's written permission to have a credit card. And again, I was out of college seven years. This is not in the Middle Ages. So what, and Craig was talking about the assumptions about single men. As Bella was saying, there are assumptions that more women are single and women are better at it and so on. But Craig was talking about the uh, gradations, the nuances in the different ways that men experience singlehood. So in answer to your question, I think even among ourselves as single people, as people who are single at heart, we are not immune to the voices of the society around us telling us certain things. And I think we need to look at whatever the assumption may be and ask ourselves, how do I know that? Am I sure about that? Have I seen counter examples? We start with ourselves before we can change anybody else's mind. And I hate to be petty, but, um, <laughs> go ahead. oh, go ahead, go ahead. I, I will snark, snark, snark. I'm not going to say what institution I was at, but similar to a comment that uh, Bella made, it's like, okay, well, since we were, it was a job search. And it's like, oh, well, this is not married, so she can go to all of the dinners. 
guess who's going to get books in their inboxes for Christmas? Everybody's getting a copy of my book. At some point in time, I want them to have the conversation and think about how they think about singles in a certain kind of unique kind of way and assume that we don't, that our extended time, in my book, I talk about how the person who's single, their extended time and their checkbook becomes the extended family checkbook and people's time when you're single is automatically assumed that it can be for other things that, at work. And so I'm like, I'm going to put a copy of my book in everybody's uh, mailbox for the holidays. So hopefully they'll read the book and think about the way in which they think about single and make a certain set of assumptions around singlehood. That's a great idea. <laughs> and Bella's book, too. But, Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Hi, thank you all for such an insightful conversation. Um, so I wanted to ask this question since Dr. Joan had just brought it up. Um, what do you think it'll take for, as a culture, more people to see singlehood and, and our perspective as like a civil rights issue? And given that we're in DC, would it have to take finally having an openly single president? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so, right. You know, this is, this is an issue about activism. Um, there are these great scholars from Europe who published this book called, um, oh, I forgot the name of it, but it's, they went to four different countries in Europe and found that in every, oh, the couple norm, that was the name of it. They found that in every country, they found progress for women. They found progress for people who weren't heterosexual. Um, they found some progress for women who didn't want to have kids, but there was almost nothing in terms of social justice um, policies for people who are single. And I think what happens is that people think of it as something that you can change. In fact, there's something that comes up quite often when I complain about all the ways in which people get benefited and protected just because they're married. Do you know that in the United States federal laws, there are hundreds of laws that benefit and protect people just because they're legally married? That's one of the reasons why some people um, work so hard to get same-sex marriage legalized. Well, when I bring this up, inevitably somebody will say, well, if you want to get all the privileges and advantages and, and benefits and protections of being married, just get married. <laughs> and it's so rude to people who really do want to get married and have tried everything in the book and still aren't. And it's oblivious to people like the single at heart who don't want to. But it's... Um, but the main thing is, no one should have to get married in order to be treated as fairly and, and kindly and equitably as people who are married. It should, it's like Joan was saying, we, we should be able to have Family Medical Leave Act to take time off to, to attend to a close friend, and our close friends should be able to take time off to attend to us when we need it. So one of the things that I hope Single at Heart will do is change this idea that, oh, you know, if you're single, just get married. <laughs> no, some of us don't want to be married, and we're never going to want to be married. And we should not have fewer rights, benefits, and protections because of that. One of the, th I, and I appreciate the comments and I echo everything that Bella said. One of the things I really appreciate about Single at Heart is that Bella decided to not go with an academic press and Bella's writing is really accessible. Sometimes academics tend to write to themselves and they disenfranchise an entire group of people. Now <laughs> Thank you. Now, my, my book is an academic press, and the introduction and chapter one are very theoretically dense, but chapter two through ten, is, it's written more so for a lay audience. So I do believe part of the conversation is already happening where we want to have, like, mass appeal. 
And Joan is trying to decide where she's going to do, if she's going to do academic or non-academic. And I think it really starts to, I appreciate that Bella's been like on Good Morning America, USA. I mean, she's been everywhere. And it can't just be an academic conversation. It needs to expand well beyond the academic conversation. And I think that single at heart is really going to take us to a much broader audience, a much broader kind of conversation. And it's going to start to have like these policy implications that we're thinking about. But in my book, I talk about like estate planning, especially if you're single and living alone. And estate planning companies and wealth management companies have reached out to me and asked if they can figure out how to tap into the single market. It felt like they were coming at it from an exploitive kind of way. So I was like, I'm not here to exploit this group of people. But if you want to think about how doing this in a very thoughtful kind of way, then I'm here for the conversation. But I do think it's important to not just think of this as just an academic idea, an academic group of people, but it's happening everywhere. And the, the books like this are really getting the word out and we can continue the conversation. <laughs> I'm going to have one sentence and then she's going to ask a question. James Buchanan is our sole U.S. single president, but obviously not in our lifetime, and he's much maligned for, he kind of gets blamed for the Civil War, but uh, <laughs> A quick statement about that. So if you, in the um, afterward of the book, I talk about Jeopardy. Do we have any Jeopardy fans in the room? So it was like um, a Jeopardy uh, the champions, Jeopardy of champions, whatever. And one of the final Jeopardy questions were like, what two um, secretaries of state were never married? James Buchanan and uh, Condoleezza Rice. But, but here's what's really, and, oh, and then I also wrote a blog about, MSNBC reached out to me and asked her, would I write a blog about Tim Scott? And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> not, about, like, not about his politics. I was like, okay, let me keep reading. But the fact that he was being drugged through the mud because he was single, they gave me 24 hours to write it. I was in a bad mood, so I got real snarky with that. So if you want to see, if you want to see a real snarky article about singlehood and how we think about singlehood, please do look at the, um, the MSNBC blog that I did about, op-ed piece that I did about Tim Scott. But the unfortunate thing about Jeopardy is that Condoleezza Rice is so decorated in so many other ways. I'm not talking about Buchanan. But at the end of the day, on a Jeopardy final question, the only thing that you're going to ask about is whether or who was never married. The audacity. So that's in the, in the preface of the, the afterward of the book. I talk about that. Uh, along those lines, has anybody else seen the bumper sticker that says, no baby on board, go ahead and run into us? <laughs> that's great. I love that. That's great. Um, I just wanted to say that you briefly mentioned what it's like to be an ally um, to folks single at heart. Right. Um, my grandmother, um, woman ahead of her time, was very much an ally to me. I'm 33 from a Latino household, and they're all very shocked every time we have dinner yeah. and I say that I'm single. And um, she would always say as long as she's happy and she's fulfilled, then let her be. Oh, um, wonderful. What are the examples in your life where you have felt the power of having an ally make a comment or be on your side because you don't, you know, always yeah. do that. So take that example with yeah. us. Um, you know, I think it's been most recently with these online communities, like the online community of single people. And that's really been great. Because um, imagine having a place where everyone likes things and almost everyone some people sneak in and they really don't <laughs> but, um, but it's um it's just refreshing and they sort of get it in a way that most people don't so i guess that's my um, favorite ally story i'm trying to think of my favorite ally story um one of the things I've, so my book came out in February and um, it isn't all, one of the things I wanted to do is I was really hoping, because I'm talking about um, black people in particular in the book, and I was really hoping that I was going to be able to go to black churches and talk about like singlehood and not one black church has invited me to come out and give, give a conversation about singlehood. Um, and it's not always easy to have a conversation about singlehood. Being partnered and being married is an albatross around the neck of America. 
And when you come in and try to get people to think about singlehood, it's not always an interesting conversation. I'm gonna take a long road to get here, get you here, but just go with me for a second. So I have a dear friend of mine who likes to, uh, he likes fair-skinned women, like light-skinned women. And one of the things that he says, like, I just like light-skinned women, and he actually married someone who's light-skinned. It's this whole notion of colorism. The closer you are to white, the more attractive you are, and so on and so forth. So he used to always say it, he used to always say it. And so one day he's like, I just like light-skinned women. He's a black guy. And so I said, no, you don't. And give a really long pregnant pause. And then I said to him, I would appreciate it and respect you if you said you've been conditioned from a very young age that you think closer to white is right, and I can respect you for that. But when you just say that's your preference structure, I have to push back on that every time. So I, I, when I think about like how being married and partners is an albatross on the neck of Americans, I often say, why do you want to be married? Again, a very long pregnant pause. We've been conditioned from a very young age that that's what we're supposed to do and that's what we're, that's what we're, we're supposed to innately just want to be married. And so when it gets hard and when it gets challenging, I think about Bella when she was writing, I swear I do, when she was writing and there weren't a lot of people out there that were supporting her, that were complimenting what she's doing. And I'm like, if Bella did it, there was doing it 20 years ago. And I know there is a Bella out there. It makes it so much easier for me. I don't have to call her. I don't have to talk to her. I just know that she's one of the foot soldiers for singlehood. And because I know she's there, I can do the work that I do. Oh, thank you. <laughs> So I think that's all the time we've got. Uh, last question. <laughs> Thank you. For Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your pioneering work. Um, it <laughs> really does challenge some expectations we have around marriage, and I think that's in relationships, and that's fantastic. So I assume that some, but not all, um, single at heart people are asexual or aromantic. There may be some interest, I heard lovers being thrown in there, that there, there, there may be some interest in that. And I can see how marriage and relationships, because the dominant paradigm is codependency and enmeshment, it's a huge sacrifice of things like your freedom, your value, your desires, which are so important and so um, fundamental to what it means to be single at heart. Right. Is it possible that we could devise partnerships and relationships and still be single at heart? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. First, let me address the asexual part of it. Um, I have this online quiz, which more than 20,000 people have answered so far. It's called, Are You Single at Heart? Now, it's not a representative sample, because it's whoever heard about the quiz and goes online and takes it. But of those who took the quiz, and were not single at heart. 3% um, were asexual. Of those who took the quiz and scored as clearly single at heart, 12% were asexual. So it's a greater number, but it's not like everybody who's single at heart. Um, the second part, what was, what was the second part? Um, forming relationships while being single oh, at heart. Oh, right. Oh, this was an interesting one, because I, I, I had to be convinced. So I thought that if there are people who are single at heart who are married, it's because they got married and they realized that they were single at heart in whatever way they thought about that to themselves. But then they just didn't want to break their vows. So they stayed married as a matter of being of integrity. And I, in fact, I did find people like that. So that's what I expected. And in a way, that's why it's called single at heart and not just happily single, because you can be married and single at heart. Now, the part that I had to be persuaded about <clears throat> were the people who were married in a, or in a committed romantic relationship and, and swore to me that they were single at heart. And I had to be convinced. And on the quiz, they usually score a little lower than people who are not in, that, in a romantic relationship. 
But what sets them apart is that they live in a way that takes advantage of what the single at heart loves. So some of them live apart from their partner, or if they live in the same house or apartment, they have their separate sides. <laughs> and they give each other a lot of space, a lot of um, autonomy. And it, it's not like, you know, one says to the other, I need my space. It's because that's how they feel, and they agree on that. And um, and so those, those are people who are committed romantically. They might be married. They might even have kids. And they don't want to change that. But they tell me, I am single at heart. Put it in your book. So I do. OK, uh, with that, I want to thank again all of our speakers for being here this evening. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you to our wonderful authors and speakers. Uh, there are a number of us going to Shaw's Tavern after this. Uh, if you want to continue the conversation uh, over some uh, delightful food, uh, there are two of us uh, who have reservation for ten. Uh, so uh, up to twenty people. Uh, we had a few people cancel, so there are a few uh, openings. But uh, even if we go over, if you want to come with us, uh, the more the merrier. So thank you so much, and thank you again, uh, Ella, Chris, and John. Um, and uh, if you want to read Single at Heart or Singled Out or the Love Jones cohort, and I'm looking forward to when we can add Jones' book to the, to the stack, uh, feel free to come over here and pick it up, uh, and you can come on stage and ask the authors to sign. Thank you again so much, everyone, for being here, and I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Thank you.